Welcome to the 15th episode of the Divine Intervention Podcasts. My name is Divine. I'm a fourth year medical student. And in today's podcast, we're going to continue our story relating to metabolism. Okay, so let's jump right in. So the first slide talks about the central dogma of metabolism. Uh, basically, uh, I mean, this is not an actual central dogma, but it's just something you want to keep in mind to help you remember how insulin and glucagon affect metabolic pathways. So insulin, think of insulin as a dephosphorylator and think of glucagon as a phosphorylator. If you can get the central principle into your head, it will make it very easy for you to remember many things. So insulin is a dephosphorylator, glucagon is a phosphorylator. So if insulin activates an enzyme, it activates it by dephosphorylation. If glucagon activates an enzyme, it activates it by phosphorylation. So next slide. So how is fructose absorbed in enterocytes? Well, that's with the GLUT5 transporter, okay? And how can glucose be converted to fructose? Well, the thing is, there is a pathway where glucose uh, can be converted to um, something known as sorbitol, okay? With an enzyme known as aldose reductase. Aldose reductase reduces aldose sugars like glucose. And then there is another enzyme known as sorbitol dehydrogenase that converts sorbitol to fructose okay and the thing is sorbitol dehydrogenase is highly expressed in certain tissues like uh, like uh, uh, like seminal vesicles and stuff like that but in other tissues it's not necessarily expressed or if it's expressed it's expressed in very minute quantities for example like the lens of the eye or schwann cells and stuff like that right or even the cells that line the nephron so if you think about it if you have limited expression of sorbitol dehydrogenase or no expression you will basically stop at the conversion of glucose to sorbitol and sorbitol is osmotically active it can pull water into cells and it can cause osmotic damage okay that's why that's one potential mechanism behind the nephropathy and the neuropathy and the retinopathy that you get in diabetes so uh what is the general pathophysiology behind lactase deficiency in general uh, the older you get, uh, at least in certain populations of individuals, especially Asians, it gets much harder to metabolize lactose, okay? So they have like reduced levels over time of lactase, okay? That's the general pathophysiology. The, there are very few people that have like absolutely no lactase from birth, okay? And remember, it's a brush border enzyme deficiency. That's another way they can test that concept on step one. Okay, next slide. So galactose metabolism, right? So uh, you may see MET21. I'm just referring to some students at my uh, at my med school. But basically, let's assume you're a milk lover. Okay, you consume milk and milk contains lactose. Okay, and lactose is a disaccharide, right? So it's broken down by the brush border enzyme lactase to glucose and galactose. Okay, and remember, glucose and galactose are both all those sugars. As you'll see later, uh, fructose is not an all those sugar. It's a ketose sugar. Okay, so glucose and galactose, but in this case, we're dealing with galactose metabolism, so let's just keep going with the pathway. Galactose can be acted on by, uh, by galactokinase to form galactose 1-phosphate, okay? And then galactose 1-phosphate uridyl transferase can help us go from galactose 1-phosphate to glucose 1-phosphate. You basically take the galactose and put it on UDP glucose. You take the glucose from UDP glucose and make glucose 1-phosphate. Okay, there's like some epimeries that exist that keeps that cycle going, but that's not relevant for, for board exams. Okay, so you form glucose 1-phosphate, that glucose 1-phosphate by some magic, by some uh, isomerase enzyme, you make glucose 6-phosphate, and then you can go into glycolysis. So, there's a lot of pathology associated with this slide that I think is high yield to know for step one. Okay, the first thing is, as we've talked about on the preceding slide, if you have a lactase deficiency, that's a brush border enzyme deficiency. Okay, pretty common in Asians. So that's the demographic you may see on exams. And if you have a lactase deficiency, lactose can build up in the lumen of your GI tract. That can osmotically draw water. Okay, so you can get an osmotic diarrhea. Okay, that's one pathology. Another pathology, we already talked about this with glucose being acted on by aldose reductase to form sorbitol. Okay. Galactose can also be acted on by all those reductase to form galactitol. Okay. And these two things, again, are osmotically active. That's why if you see in galactose metabolism disorders, there's almost always cataracts. Okay. Because the galactitol builds up in the lens, attracts water, that will pacifies the lens and you get cataracts. Okay. Uh, but you don't get that in a fructose metabolism disorder as you'll see on the, on the next slide. 
Now, one high yield thing you want to know, if a person has classic galactosemia, I'm going to talk about that. I guess let me just talk about that next, and then I'll jump down to the green stuff at the bottom. Okay, so galactokinase deficiency, uh, it's a deficiency of galactokinase, that's pretty obvious. And basically, the thing that happens is if you have that deficiency, you have a lot of galactose in your blood, okay, uh, but it's not very severe, okay. But the big thing you want to watch out for on that with that deficiency is that those people tend to have um, cataracts again for the galactitol reasons that I explained. That's one because uh, even if galactokinase cannot act on galactose. Um, all those reductases can almost cert can certainly act on uh, galactose, okay? So you can get the cataracts with that. But the reason this is not very severe is that hexokinase can also actually act on galactose. So the phenotype is pretty mild. Other than the cataracts, you don't get very significant liver symptoms or anything of that sort. But if you have a second enzyme deficiency in galactose metabolism, that's a GALT deficiency or GAL1 phosphoridyl transferase, you have much more severe problems, right? Because the thing is, in galactokinase deficiency, you're not necessarily trapping galactose 1-phosphate in cells. In GALT deficiency, you are in fact trapping galactose 1-phosphate in cells. And GAL1-phos is very osmotically active, so that phosphate trapping can pull water, that uh, like sugar, like phosphorylated sugar, it's trapped in the liver, for example, it can bring in water and it can destroy the hepatocytes. And you also get many other problems, right? So you get cataracts, uh, like we said for galactokinase deficiency, you get a lot of vomiting, okay? You get a lot of uh, mental, you, uh, those kids classically have a uh, mental retardation. It's actually a pretty uh, nasty uh, disease. So those people in general, they will want to avoid lactose or galactose containing items in the diet because they cannot metabolize galactose, okay? Now, if you have a GALT deficiency, it's known as essential galactosemia. Uh, one high yield tidbit you certainly want to know for step one, and even for step two and like uh, shelf exams, is that people that have a GALT deficiency, they have a very high risk of death from sepsis with E. coli. No one really knows why that's the case, but it's something you would definitely, definitely, definitely want to know going forward. It's a very high yield concept. Uh, not many people know that stuff, but it's something you definitely want to know for tests. So let's jump on to the next next slide. Fructose metabolism, right? Fructose metabolism is, uh, is a little simpler, okay? So you consume like fruits, right? Like oranges, right? Uh, that contains sucrose. Sucrose is also a disaccharide, okay? It's acted on by sucrase, okay, which is a brush butter enzyme. Remember, you can only reabsorb monosaccharides. You have no ability to reabsorb disaccharides. So that sucrase breaks up sucrose to glucose and fructose. We already talked about how fructose enters enterocytes with the GLUT5 transporter, okay? That transporter is also very heavily expressed in spermatocytes because sperm actually uses uh, fructose as its uh, source of energy, okay? So... Fructose is then converted to fructose 1-phosphate by fructokinase, okay? If you have a deficiency of fructokinase, uh, that's something called essential fructosuria. You just have a ton of fructose in your blood, a ton of fructose in your urine. Not a big deal, okay? It's a pretty benign, again, because hexokinase also has the ability to uh, act on fructose in a minor pathway. Now, fructose 1-phosphate is then cleaved by aldolase B, not aldolase A, aldolase B. Remember, aldolase B is in fructose metabolism, aldolase A is in glycolysis, okay? Aldolase B cleaves fructose 1-phosphate to DHAP, dihydroxyacetone phosphate and glyceraldehyde, okay? If you have a deficiency of aldolase B, a second enzyme problem, okay, you have more severe issues, okay, again, because the fructose 1-phosphate is trapped in cells, because once the sugar is phosphorylated, it has a very hard time getting out of a cell, so that fructose 1-phosphate osmotically draws water into tissues, and you can get very, very serious problems with that. In fact, an aldolase B deficiency is known as fructose intolerance. So the principle I want you to establish here is that uh, the first enzyme deficiency in galactose or fructose metabolism is bad but not very severe, but the second enzyme deficiency is almost always pretty devastating, okay? So that's one thing you certainly want to keep in mind, okay? And uh, these kids tend to have like a lot of hypoglycemia again because the liver is not working right. Remember, the liver is the primary organ of gluconeogenesis. Uh, they have like increased levels of bilirubin because again, remember that the, the liver takes... Uh, uh, 
uh, takes care of like bilirubin metabolism. Sorry, the error with the urea cycle and all that stuff. Uh, but actually, these people actually tend to have a hyperammonemia because they go into liver uh, failure relatively uh, rapidly. Okay, and then the type 2 RTA business, I'll talk about it in a later podcast. Uh, I have to give like a big explanation to highlight that concept, but I'll talk about it later. But just remember that a type 2 RTA is associated with um, Odolis B deficiency, which is a fructose intolerance. Just something to keep in mind. Now, fructose, like I said, is not an aldose sugar, it's a ketose sugar. Okay, and as far as I know, there is no such thing as ketose reductase. Okay, so you do not get uh, you do not get the cataracts that you classically observe in galactose, uh, metabol- uh, galactose uh, metabolic disorders, okay? So if you see cataracts on your exam, think of a problem with galactose metabolism. If you see no cataracts, think more about a problem with fructose metabolism. And if you go to the next slide, uh, you also sort of want to like think of your temporal associations, right? Breast milk contains a lot of lactose, so galactose problems, galactose metabolism problems tend to show up uh, like in the first few days of life versus fructose metabolism problems that tend to show up after like six months when fruits are slowly uh, introduced into the diet, okay? And again, I already talked about how the second enzyme deficiency is more severe. Okay, so next slide. So discussion of microbe destruction in lysosomes of macrophages after phagocytosis by the respiratory burst, right? So basically I'm referring to the respiratory burst pathway that operates in neutrophils and macrophages and in a lot of our white blood cells, right? So when you phagocytose something, you will get it to the lysosome to destroy it, okay? And you use something known as the oxidative burst to make that happen. So the first step of the oxidative burst is an enzyme known as NADPH oxidase, okay? NADPH oxidase takes molecular oxygen and helps you convert it to superoxide radicals, okay? And then superoxide dismutase helps you convert those superoxide radicals to hydrogen peroxide, I mean, uh, uh, yeah, hydrogen peroxide, H2O2. And then myeloperoxidase converts the hydrogen peroxide to hypochlorous acid, which is basically bleach, okay? And if you have a deficiency of the first enzyme in that pathway, um, uh, NADPH oxidase deficiency, you will have something known as chronic granulomatous disease, right? So in chronic granulomatous disease, those people have an NADPH oxidase deficiency. They basically cannot make um, uh, hydrogen peroxide. So those people have to depend on the production of hydrogen peroxide from, from bacteria, okay? You, those uh, people, they co the hydrogen peroxide from bacteria uh, act on it with myeloperoxidase, make bleach and kill that bacteria. But if that bacteria has an enzyme known as catalase, which has the ability to break up hydrogen peroxide to oxygen, I mean to basically metabolize it to uh, water and oxygen, then those people would have an increased risk of infection with those kinds of organisms, right? So catalase positive organisms like Staph aureus, like E. coli, like Aspergillus, okay? So that's something you definitely want to keep in mind. Now, the ALS relationship is, I'm just trying to refer to the second enzyme in the pathway. I remember that a superoxide dismutase mutation is associated with um, uh, familial uh, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. So that's just one factoid you want to know. And uh, the AML relationship is that, remember that uh, myeloid cells uh, have myeloperoxidase as a as a marker okay so remember if my if you have a hematologic malignancy and it's myeloperoxidase positive mpo positive you know it's of uh, myeloid origin origin as against being of lymphoid origin and another thing you can actually think of those hour rods that you see in the m3 kind of uh, aml acute promyelocytic leukemia those hour rods are actually made of myeloperoxidase remember that if those hour rods spill into circulation they can cause a dic and death now Glutathione is an agent that really helps us deal with oxidative stress, okay? And the thing is, um, it's a, actually a pretty essential pathway to reducing, to providing, uh, reducing power for our cells, right? So if, for example, you're subjected to high stress with hydrogen peroxide, uh, that hydrogen peroxide is converted to water and oxygen with an enzyme known as glutathione peroxidase. Glutathione peroxidase oxidizes glutathione, but remember it's a redox reaction. So as something is being oxidized, the other thing is being reduced. As glutathione is oxidized from its reduced form to its oxidized form, 
hydrogen peroxide is converted from its oxidized form to its reduced form, which is water and oxygen, which is much safer. But if you want to keep that cycle going, you need to reconvert the oxidized glutathione back to reduced glutathione. You do that with an enzyme known as glutathione reductase, okay? And that enzyme depends on NADPH as a cofactor. That's why you can see that if you have a G6PD deficiency where you're not making NADPH, okay? Because remember, uh, the pentose phosphate pathway, one of its byproducts is NADPH. If you have a G6PD deficiency, you're not making NADPH. You're not making a cofactor for the regeneration of reduced glutathione to keep that glutathione cycle going. And one thing I will bring uh, into play here is that there is a drug that actually works like it's basically a glutathione analog because it has a lot of uh, sulfhydro groups. Uh, the drug I'm referring to is N-acetylcysteine. Okay, N-acetylcysteine is a pretty ubiquitous drug. It uh, you can use it to treat acetaminophen toxicity because remember acetaminophen can be metabolized to an agent known as NAPQI. Okay, and that NAPQI is a very powerful oxidizing agent. So if you give reducing power in the form of N-acetylcysteine. Okay, you could dumb down the, the oxidative damage that you get with acetaminophen toxicity, and you could potentially stave off uh, liver damage. Okay, so that's one thing N acetylcysteine can do, do for you. Okay, uh, N acetylcysteine can do many other things, right? So it can cleave disulfide bonds, okay, in mucus plugs. So you can use that to treat the cystic fibrosis to sort of break up the nasty, goopy stuff that clogs up your airways. Um, you can actually use N-acetylcysteine as well to prevent contrast-induced nephropathy, okay? Because uh, one of the thoughts is that contrast creates a lot of free radicals that damage the kidney and cause a kind of intrarenal, acute renal failure, okay? So you can give uh, N-acetylcysteine prophylactically to sort of prevent that. Another thing you can use N-acetylcysteine for is you can actually use it to, to prophylax against the... Uh, bladder toxicity, right? The hemorrhagic cystitis that you get with cyclophosphamide. Remember, cyclophosphamide makes a metabolite known as acrolein, and that acrolein is toxic to the bladder. Uh, you're classically thought that you could use mesna for that, and mesna does in fact work better, but you could get an unusual step one question where N acetylcysteine is actually the right answer. Okay, you can actually use N acetylcysteine to prophylax against the hemorrhagic cystitis that goes with uh, cyclophosphamide. Now, CGD, I already talked about how CGD is treated in the previous podcast. I said because it's a macrophage problem, you can try to give something that spruces up macrophage function like interferon gamma. Okay, next slide. So how does isoniazid cause seizures? How does isoniazid cause seizures? The mechanism behind isoniazid causing seizures is that isoniazid depletes your vitamin B6, and it so happens that vitamin B6 is the cofactor for an enzyme known as glutamate decarboxylase. Glutamate decarboxylase helps you go from glutamate to GABA, okay, and glutamate is sort of an excitatory neurotransmitter, GABA is an inhibitory neurotransmitter, okay, so if you deplete your B6, you have no cofactor for glutamate decarboxylase, your glutamate levels build up, okay, and you can get uh, seizures with that, okay, so that's one potential mechanism behind INH causing seizures, and I want to draw your attention to the fact that autoantibodies against glutamate decarboxylase are associated with uh, type 1 diabetes. Okay, and uh, this is another like off-putting question. How does the urea cycle relate to nitric oxide synthesis? Remember that one of the byproducts of the urea cycle is arginine. Okay, and arginine can be acted on by nitric oxide synthase to make nitric oxide. Remember, nitric oxide is a powerful vasodilator, so it decreases afterload. Now, next question says, patient with recurrent episodes of bronchospasm, flushing, and diarrhea, okay, presents with new onset memory loss and a diffuse body rash. A holosystolic murmur is heard at the left lower sternal border. Okay, so if you see a person having bronchospasm, they have flushing, they have diarrhea, okay, I really hope you're thinking about carcinoid syndrome, okay, there's a very nice mnemonic for carcinoid syndrome, it's called BFDR, okay, the B stands for bronchospasm, the F stands for flushing, the D stands for diarrhea, and the R stands for right-sided heart lesions. The reason you get right-sided heart lesions is that the serotonin that's secreted by the carcinoid tumor um, can be metabolized by the lungs, okay? It's, it, uh, so the serotonin will basically like screw up the right side of your heart, but the lung endothelium has the ability to metabolize that serotonin, okay? So it doesn't make its way to the left side of your heart, so you do not get left-sided heart 
problems okay and in general you get symptoms with carcinoid syndrome when you have mets to the liver the most common location of uh, carcinoid tumor is in the appendix okay so uh, the liver has the ability just like the lungs to metabolize the serotonin but once you have mets from the appendix to the liver then the serotonin can then move all over the body and begin to cause these are uh, these are uh, systemic uh, symptoms okay so why does this person have this new and hopefully remember holosystolic murmur left low sternal border i really hope you're thinking about a tricuspid regurg okay in general in carcinoid syndrome you either get tricuspid regurg or pulmonic stenosis tricuspid regurg or pulmonic stenosis okay there's a nice mnemonic for that it's called tips okay tricuspid insufficiency pulmonic stenosis those are the lesions you tend to get with carcinoid syndrome now why does this person have new onset memory loss and a diffuse body rash well carcinoid is a tumor that over secretes serotonin where does serotonin come from i mean if i'll give you a clue uh serotonin is also known as 5 ht or 5 hydroxy tryptophan okay so that should tell you that it comes from tryptophan okay it so happens that tryptophan is also a precursor to the formation of niacin vitamin b3 okay so if you're diverting all the tryptophan that you have in your body towards the synthesis of serotonin because you a person has carcinoid syndrome they don't make as much niacin as they could make okay and they can get pellagra from that okay remember the remember the four d's of pellagra okay diarrhea okay dermatitis right so that's the skin rash dementia right so that's the memory loss and death which is uh, not ideal so that's something you want to keep in mind okay and i've talked about the valvular lesions and the real quick thing i'll just say about hydroxylation reactions is not always true but i'll see that tetrahydrobiopterin bh4 um, appears to be a pretty common cofactor for many hydroxylation reactions in the body take for example uh, the conversion of phenylalanine to tyrosine with phenylalanine hydroxylase i uh, remember that's the enzyme that's deficient in a pku okay but basically uh, that's a hydroxylation reaction it depends on on bh4 okay there's at least like four or five biochem reactions that are tested on step one that also have uh bh4 as a cofactor so just take that concept away tetrahydrobiopterin uh bh4 cofactor for hydroxylation reactions in the body especially with uh, amino acids okay so next slide location of fatty acid synthesis right so where does fatty acid synthesis happen fatty acid synthesis happens in the cytosol okay that's an easy question uh the feedstock for fatty acid synthesis is acetyl coa okay you basically join up a bunch of acetyl coa monomers to make a fatty acid okay and how does this feedstock leave the mitochondria well the thing is, acetyl-CoA cannot leave the mitochondria on its own, okay? The way acetylcholine leaves, I mean, sorry, acetyl-CoA leaves the mitochondria is that it's converted to citrate, okay? So acetyl-CoA is two carbons. It pairs up with oxaloacetate four carbons to make citrate, okay? There's a citrate transporter in the mitochondrial membrane. So that citrate goes out the mitochondria, okay? And then that citrate, it's split back or split right back into oxaloacetate so this is now in the cytosol it's split right back into oxaloacetate and acetyl-CoA that acetyl-CoA continues its destiny for fatty acid synthesis the oxaloacetate continues its destiny for for a pathway I'm going to talk about uh, in a few minutes okay so that's how the acetyl-CoA gets out of the mitochondria and you may ask yourself come on divine can't the acetyl-CoA just do the TCA cycle in the mitochondria and be done for the day well the thing is if the tca cycle keeps running you'll make a ton of atp you'll make a ton of nadh that atp and nadh are very powerful inhibitors of the rate limiting enzyme of the tca cycle isocitrate dehydrogenase okay so when they inhibit that enzyme everything proximal to that enzyme begins to build up like acetyl coa okay that's the inducement for fatty acid synthesis to begin now the rate limiting enzyme of fatty acid synthesis is acetyl coa carboxylase okay basically helps you convert acetyl coa to malonyl coa and then you do some magic and you ultimately make a fatty acid okay now acetyl coa carboxylase has carboxylase in the name any enzyme that is a carboxylase enzyme always uses three things okay it uses atp in that reaction that's an a it uses biotin in that reaction that's a b that's vitamin b7 okay and then it uses co2 in that reaction as well because it's a carboxylase enzyme right so it should make sense that it uses carbon dioxide okay so all carboxylase enzymes are abc enzymes they use atp 
biotin of vitamin B7 and CO2. And remember that you can get a biotin deficiency if you consume a ton of egg whites, okay? Right, because egg whites contain avidin, and avidin is a very powerful vitamin B7 binder. Okay, now, how is fatty acid synthesis regulated? Well, fatty acid syn synthesis is regulated by three primary mechanisms you want to know, primarily in the context of acetyl -CoA carboxylase, okay? So, uh, think about it. Will insulin or glucagon promote the storage of fat? Well, I hope you're thinking insulin. And how does insulin work? Is insulin a phosphorylator or a dephosphorylator? I said this in the beginning. It's a dephosphorylator, okay? So that means the dephosphorylated form of acetyl -CoA carboxylase is the active form, okay? While the phosphorylated form of acetyl -CoA carboxylase is the inactive form, okay? So... Uh, when acetyl -CoA carboxylase is not phosphorylated, it's active. That's what insulin wants. When acetyl -CoA carboxylase is phosphorylated, it is not active. That is what glucagon wants. Okay, remember, glucagon works through a G-protein coupled receptor. Okay. Now, uh, in terms of feedforward activation, uh, citrate is a powerful feedforward activator of acetyl -CoA carboxylase. Okay, but the product of fatty acid synthesis. Palmitol CoA, it's like a 16 carbon fatty acid, is a very powerful feedback inhibitor of acetyl CoA carboxylase. So that's the way acetyl CoA carboxylase is mentioned in general. And citrate feed forward, act, feed forward activating acetyl CoA carboxylase um, just reminds me to tell you that uh, if you go back to glycolysis, right, the last enzyme of glycolysis, pyruvate kinase, okay, it's actually regulated by feed forward activation. Okay, with a substrate known as fructose 1,6-base phosphate. Fructose 1,6-base phosphate is actually a feedforward activator of pyruvate kinase. Okay, feedforward activation is not very common in metabolism, so whenever it pops up, it's usually high yield for exams. Uh, the two high yield essential fatty acids uh, there's uh, linoleic, there's uh, alpha linolenic acid and linoleic acid. That's just something you want to memorize, it's commonly tested on exams. And then the two sources of NADPH for fatty acid synthesis. Um, I'll say the big thing you want to remember here is that uh, G6PD, glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase, from the, from the oxidative phase of the pentose phosphate pathway, makes NADPH as a byproduct. So that's one source of NADPH. But uh, there is another high-yield source of NADPH that I'm going to talk about now. So this is where I'm going back to that citrate story that I sort of dropped for a bit, right? So we said that in the mitochondria, acetyl CoA cannot make its way out. So it combines with oxaloacetate to form citrate. That citrate goes through a citrate transporter, okay? And then that citrate is cleaved by an enzyme known as ATP citrate lyase into acetyl CoA that continues its destiny as a part of the of fatty acid synthesis. And then that oxaloacetate is actually reconverted back to malate, okay, in the cytosol by an enzyme known as malate dehydrogenase, okay? Malate dehydrogenase does, in fact, also exists in the mitochondria, but there is another isoform that also exists in the cytosol, okay? So malate dehydrogenase converts oxaloacetate to malate, and then that malate can be converted back to pyruvate by an enzyme known as NADP-dependent malic enzyme, okay? Malic enzyme converts malate to pyruvate, but it actually forms NADPH as a byproduct. And then that pyruvate can be recycled back into the mitochondria to uh, go back to the TCA cycle or to keep the cycle of fatty acid synthesis going, okay? Because it can undergo the pyruvate dehydrogenase complex, make acetyl CoA, uh, that acetyl CoA can pair up with oxaloacetate again, form citrate, get out of the cell, and then do what I just described, okay? So those are the two high yield sources of NADPH, malic enzyme and glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase. So next slide. Now, we're jumping into glycolysis, okay? Glycolysis, you don't need to know the enzymes in the pathway, but I'll say there are certain high-yield enzymes you generally want to know, and I'm going to emphasize them. And while I'm concurrently discussing the pathway, I'll also discuss the regulation, okay? So the first step of glycolysis is that you want to trap glucose in a cell. Uh, you trap glucose in cells by phosphorylating glucose, okay? So how do you phosphorylate glucose? You use a kinase. Kinases are enzymes that phosphorylate things. So hexokinase, right, hexo, six carbons. Glucose is a six carbon sugar. It's a six carbon aldo sugar. So hexokinase converts glucose to glucose six phosphate, okay? Uh, remember that in general, you find hexokinase everywhere in the body, okay? But the enzyme that does that same reaction in the liver, in the beta cells of the pancreas, in the kidneys, for example, is glucokinase, okay? Glucokinase helps us convert glucose to glucose six phosphate, 
Okay, and remember that if you wanted to reverse that reaction in gluconeogenesis, for example, um, that will be um, uh, with the use of glucose 6-phosphatase. Okay, remember that enzyme is highly expressed in the endoplasmic reticulum. Okay, and if you have a deficiency of glucose 6-phosphatase, you have a glycogen storage disease type 1. Okay, that's von Gierke's disease. Now, there are certain different high yield differences between hexokinase and glucokinase. Okay, hexokinase is feedback inhibited by glucose 6-phosphate, which is its product. Okay, but glucokinase is not. Okay, glucokinase, uh, like I said, it's more liver specific. Uh, it's not feedback inhibited by glucose 6-phosphate. Uh, it's actually feedback inhibited by fructose 6-phosphate, and I'll talk about the mechanism behind that in an upcoming slide. Okay, and unlike hexokinase, where insulin does not necessarily increase its genetic expression, insulin does increase the genetic expression of glucokinase. So that's another high yield thing you want to keep in mind. Okay, and again, this first step is to phosphorylate the glucose so you can trap the glucose in the cell. Now, next slide. Okay, so key differences between hexo and glucokinase. Hexokinase has a low KM, so it has a very high affinity for glucose. Okay, and it has a very low Vmax. Okay, so it has a uh, um, it gets to its maximum rate of reaction very quickly. And why does this make any sense? It should make sense because hexokinase is uh, expressed in many tissues of the body, like the brain, for example. You want your brain always depends on glucose. So even if your blood glucose levels are low, okay, hexokinase will be working at max capacity, which is a good thing, okay, because you want to supply glucose to your organs. But glucokinase is different. Glucokinase, think of it as a glucose sensing enzyme. Okay, it has a high KM and it has a high Vmax. Because the thing is, uh, by having a high KM and a high Vmax, that means there is a very wide range over blood glucose concentrations over which glucokinase can work. That's why it works as a very good sensor. Okay, and the thing is, when you hit blood glucose levels of like 15 millimolar, for example, right? Uh, hexokinase is already operating at like max, max, max speed, okay? But glucokinase is beginning to get going, and that helps you again uh, bring more glucose into the liver so that you can store it as glycogen, for example, okay? So glucokinase has a high KM, so it has a lower affinity for glucose, and it has a high Vmax. And because it has a high KM and it has low affinity, if you have a mutation in glucokinase, okay, you won't be able to sense blood glucose levels very well, okay? So you'll be hyperglycemic for longer periods of time, and that can uh, create a, a kind of diabetes. That's uh, known as MODI, uh, maturity onset of diabetes of the young, okay? Uh, it's classically like the fit diabetic. Like you see these people, they're diabetic, but they're super fit. They're like, uh, I mean, I'm not saying they're ripped or anything, but they're not obese like you observe in many diabetics, okay? So let's jump to the next slide and talk about how hexokinase is regulated. I mean, glucokinase is regulated. So glucokinase is regulated by a protein known as glucokinase regulatory protein. Okay. The way this protein works is that it binds to glucokinase and sends it to the nucleus. Glucokinase is useless in the nucleus. Okay. But the thing is, glucokinase regulatory protein has the ability to bind fructose 6-phosphate or glucose, okay? When it's bound by glucose, it has a lower affinity for glu uh, glucokinase, so glucokinase can then come out of the nucleus, come to the cytosol, and do its job. But if glucokinase regulator regulatory protein is bound by, by fructose 6-phosphate, it actually makes it have a higher affinity for glucokinase. When it has a higher affinity for glucokinase, it takes it to the nucleus, and glucokinase cannot do its job. Okay, so this is how fructose 6-phosphate negatively regulates the activity of glucokinase. So next slide. So next step of glycolysis, right? So it's where you go from fructose 6-phosphate to fructose 1,6-base phosphate. The enzyme that helps you go from glucose 6-phosphate to fructose 6-phosphate is not relevant for exams. But fructose 6-phosphate is converted to fructose 1,6-base phosphate by the rate-limiting enzyme of glycolysis known as PFK1, phosphofructokinase 1, okay? And phosphofructokinase 1, right, because it's the rate-limiting enzyme of glycolysis, it has a lot of regulation, okay, it has a lot of regulation. And if you think about it, if glycolysis helps you make energetic intermediates, it should thus make sense that um, anything that speaks high energy should inhibit PFK1. Anything that screams low energy should activate PFK1. Because if you have low energy, you want glycolysis to happen so you can make ATP to power the cell. So, an Low energy substrate like AMP, adenosine monophosphate, actually activates PFK1, but high energy indicators like ATP and citrate actually inhibit PFK1, okay? 
But there is something else that also activates PFK1, and this is fructose 2 6 bisphosphate. Think of fructose 2 6 bisphosphate as the conduit that enables humans to hormonally regulate the activity of PFK1. Okay? So, just like fructose 1 6 bisphosphate is made by PFK1, fructose 2 6 bisphosphate is made by PFK2. Okay? That's not where the story ends. It so happens that PFK2 is part of a bifunctional enzyme complex, okay? The bifunctional enzyme complex includes PFK2, which converts fructose 6-phosphate to fructose 2,6-bisphosphate, and fructose 2,6-bisphosphatase, which reverses that reaction, converts fructose 2,6-bisphosphate to fructose 6-phosphate, okay? So, the thing is, I just told you that fructose 2,6-bisphosphate is an activator of PFK1. Okay, and we know that insulin is proglycolysis, so it should make sense that the formation of fructose 2 6 bisphosphate is encouraged by insulin. And if we know that PFK2 helps us make fructose 2 6 bisphosphate, and you know that insulin is proglycolysis and fructose 2 6 bisphosphate is an activator of PFK1, that should help you remember that the dephosphorylated form of PFK2 is its active form. Okay, so when you dephosphorylate, uh, dephosphorylate PFK2, right, um, you make, you activate PFK2, you make more fructose 2,6-bisphosphate, okay, and then that fructose 2,6-bisphosphate can then go and activate PFK1, okay? I'm not going to talk about the reverse reaction because it's just something you have to take the opposite of, okay, and you will get that regulation down. Okay, this is not something you really need to memorize. If you just remember the central dogma, dogma of metabolism I talked about earlier, and you talk about how uh, oh insulin is a dephosphorylator and how it's a proglycolysis, you can basically recreate all this from memory. So next slide. Uh, so fructose two one six bisphosphate broken down to by aldolase A, not aldolase B. Remember aldolase B is the enzyme that's deficient in hereditary fructose intolerance. Okay, but aldolase A converts fructose one six bisphosphate to DHAP, dihydroxyacetone phosphate, and glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate, okay? And that glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate, okay, can be converted by glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate dehydrogenase to 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate, okay? Uh, because this enzyme, glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate dehydrogenase, has dehydrogenase in the name, you should know that you're either using up or making NADH, FADH2, or NADPH in this reaction. In this reaction, we're actually making NADH, okay? Um, this NADH can actually have multiple fates, okay? It can actually go to the electron transport chain to complex one, okay? To supply uh, 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 power for the synthesis of uh, ATP. Another thing that the red cells actually use this NADH for is that they use it to convert methemoglobin, which is hemoglobin that has iron in the three plus state, the ferric form, to regular hemoglobin, which has iron in the two plus state. Okay, remember two plus iron is the iron that can carry oxygen. Uh, three plus iron actually cannot carry oxygen, okay? So methemoglobin reductase uses NAD, NADH as a cofactor to convert methemoglobin to hemoglobin in a red cell because a red cell's job is to carry oxygen, okay? But another thing you want to keep in mind is that uh, methemoglobin actually has a very good ability to bind um, cyanide, okay? So if a person actually is poisoned with cyanide, uh, one treatment is to actually induce a methemoglobinema, methemoglobinemia with a drug known as imonitrate. It's a powerful oxidizing agent. Remember, oxidation is an increase in oxidation number. If your oxidation number is becoming more positive, um, you're oxidizing a substance. Okay, so you go from Fe2 plus to Fe3 plus. Fe3 plus has a very high affinity for cyanide. You bind up that cyanide and then you give thiosulfate to help you form thiocyanate and then you poop or pee out the cyanide safely. Okay, so that's one application of this uh, of this pathway. Okay, and off to the side, you'll see glycerol 3-phosphate listed as coming from dihydroxyacetone phosphate under the action of the enzyme glycerol 3-phosphate dehydrogenase. Um, please don't confuse glycerol 3-phosphate dehydrogenase with glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate dehydrogenase. Okay, glycerol 3-phosphate dehydrogenase helps you make glycerol 3-phosphate. Okay, glycerol 3-phosphate is used for triglyceride synthesis. I'll talk about that in a later podcast. Next slide. So, 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate can be converted to 3-phosphoglycerate, okay? So, this is the first step where you make ATP in glycolysis, okay? This is substrate-level phosphorylation. So, you're converting ADP directly to ATP, okay? And then, by some magic, you go from 3-phosphoglycerate to phosphoenolpyruvate, 
and then you have the last step of glycolysis okay the last step here is that phosphoenol pyruvate is converted to pyruvate by an enzyme known as pyruvate kinase i already talked about how pyruvate kinase is feed forward activated by fructose 1,6 base phosphate okay what's the other enzyme i mentioned that is also feed forward activated acetyl-CoA carboxylase okay remember that's feed forward activated by citrate so pyruvate kinase converts phosphoenol pyruvate to pyruvate okay uh, in addition to being activated by fructose 1 6 base phosphate anything again that screams high energy inhibits uh, pyruvate kinase okay so atp is an inhibitor of pyruvate kinase uh, alanine is also an inhibitor of pyruvate kinase and that should sort of make sense if you have high levels of alanine it's kind of indicative potentially of a high energy state because pyruvate can be converted by alt to alanine okay pyruvate is like the alpha keto acid of alanine okay so it should sort of make sense that alanine is an inhibitor of pyruvate kinase and remember that a pyruvate kinase deficiency is actually one of the most common causes or one of the is one of the most common glycolytic enzyme deficiencies that perpetuates a hemolytic anemia i'll talk about the mechanism behind that in a different podcast so this pyruvate kinase step also makes atp okay and again this is another example of substrate level phosphorylation now uh on the left of this slide you see 13 bpg being converted to 23 bpg okay uh, there's an enzyme known as bpg mutase that does that it's actually a pretty heavily expressed enzyme in red cells and you may ask yourself hmm, why does this make any sense well remember that 23 bpg okay binds to the beta subunit of hemoglobin remember hemoglobin has two alphas and two betas okay at least the uh, hemoglobin a so that beta subunit can be bound by 23 bpg and that shifts the oxyhemoglobin dissociation curve to the right okay so that it can enable red cells to release more oxygen okay but contrast that with um fatal hemoglobin that is 2 alpha 2 gamma has no beta subunits okay you need those beta subunits to bind 23 bpg okay so because fatal hemoglobin does not have that beta subunit it cannot bind 23 bpg that's why hemoglobin F is left shifted, and that makes sense because it creates a gradient of oxygen flow from maternal hemoglobin, which should be hemoglobin A, to the fetal hemoglobin, which is hemoglobin F, because hemoglobin F has a higher affinity for oxygen compared to hemoglobin A. Okay, so um, next slide. Uh, some other important stuff, uh, pyruvate kinase, uh, you can almost predict what i'm gonna say here right it's regulated by phosphorylation and dephosphorylation right and we already established that insulin is proglycolysis okay so that means that the dephosphorylated form of pyruvate kinase is the active form okay so hopefully with this you're seeing that regulation in metabolism is actually very easy to remember okay you just need to put certain principles together and you don't need to memorize much okay and in glycolysis you make two atps okay uh, net two net ATPs you make two net NADHs and two pyruvates okay uh, remember you're getting two pyruvates because glucose six carbon is split into two pyruvates okay and pyruvate has many fates okay you can form lactate under the action of lactate dehydrogenase uh, basically the point of this step is it helps to regenerate NAD so that the glycerol the high three phosphate dehydrogenase step can keep working okay Alternatively, pyruvate can go into the mitochondria and be acted on by the pyruvate dehydrogenase complex. I'll talk about that in a different podcast to make acetyl-CoA, okay? Another thing that could happen is that pyruvate can be acted on by pyruvate carboxylase, okay, which uses acetyl-CoA as a cofactor, okay? Acetyl-CoA is a very powerful allosteric, in fact, I'll say it's an obligate activator of uh, pyruvate carboxylase okay uh you can form oaa from that and again because it's a it's a carboxylase enzyme it's adding an extra co2 okay uh that's why you're going from three carbon pyruvate to four carbon oxaloacetate and that oxaloacetate can make its way uh up the glycolysis chain because remember many of those reactions are reversible to ultimately form glucose in gluconeogenesis okay uh and remember that because pyruvate carboxylase again is a carboxylase enzyme it's abc so it uses atp uses biotin and uses carbon dioxide okay so next slide uh glue transporters so this is what i'm going to end with today uh glue transporters uh basically uh you just want to know that they are heavily expressed uh in many in specific organs of the body and you want to know which organ expresses what okay so like glut one uh, GLUT1 uh, is found in the brain and red cells. It has a low KM again because your brain and your red cells, they depend very heavily on glycolysis. 
okay so because he has a low chem he has a very high affinity for glucose so that even if your blood glucose levels are super low those transporters are still working super well okay to maintain your blood glucose levels now glut 2 is found in the pancreas okay uh, the beta cells of the pancreas and in the liver okay and glut 2 the glut 2 transporter uh, is bidirectional and it should make sense because remember the liver participates in glycolysis but it also participates in gluconeogenesis so the liver even if it brings glucose in through the GLU2 transporter, it can also export that glucose through the GLU2 transporter as well, okay? Because uh, remember that the liver expresses glucose 6-phosphate, so it can convert glucose 6-phosphate to glucose, okay? So if you're an organ that supplies glucose to other organs, you should have a bidirectional transporter. That should kind of make sense, okay? Because that glucose actually has to, like, leave the liver, for example, in some way, shape, or form. Now... Uh, GLU3 is expressed in many tissues, is also expressed in the brain. GLU4 uh, is expressed in adipocytes and in muscle, okay? I remember that with 4AM, okay? So GLU4, adipocytes and muscle. And one special thing to know about GLU4 is it's actually induced by insulin, okay? Uh, not necessarily, you don't necessarily make more GLU4 with insulin, but insulin, uh, one of the things it does is it causes you to place more GLU4 transporters on the cell membrane of an adipocyte or skeletal muscle, okay? And then GLUT5, I already talked about how that transports fructose, okay? And then uh, glucose, uh, remember when you consume glucose and it's broken down by those brush border disaccharidases, of which lactase is an example, okay? Um, you form those monosaccharides. Those monosaccharides, they go in through secondary active transport into the enterocyte by using the SGLT transporters, the sodium glucose linked transporters. Remember that sodium is primarily an extracellular ion, okay? So as it goes down its gradient into the cell, uh, it carries glucose alongside, okay? SGLT1. Uh, don't forget uh, SGLT2 transporters that you find in the, in the proximal convoluted tubule that are inhibited by drugs like uh, canagliflozin. Okay, uh, that's an anti-diabetes medication. I'll talk about that drug in a, in a different podcast. Okay, so the last slide, uh, GLUT1 transporters, again, they have a low KM, okay? So they basically bring in a constant amount of glucose per unit of time, okay? Contrast that with the GLUT2 transporters that have a much higher KM, lower affinity. So they bring in a more constant fraction of glucose per unit of time. And the thing is, again, think of your liver, uh, or your beta cells of the pancreas, let's say more beta cells of the pancreas, as having a glucose sensing mechanism, okay? This is actually kind of coupled to the GLU2 transporter, okay? And I've talked about why the GLU2 transporters are bidirectional, and I've talked about how GLU4 transporters are insulin dependent, although when you begin to work out, your muscle needs glucose like crazy, okay? So there is actually an insulin independent mechanism where you can put more GLU4 transporters on the surface of skeletal muscle in the setting of exercise, okay? That's why exercise is good for diabetes because you don't necessarily need insulin, but you're just putting GLU4 on the surface of skeletal muscle and uh, skeletal muscle cells. So you're basically clearing the blood of glucose, okay? So that's where we're going to stop today. Uh, I'm going to pick up with another podcast. I hope you will have a wonderful day. Uh, God bless you and I'll see you next time. Thank you.